Seinfeldia came out in 2016. I had an event planned and I was in the car going there and kind of going over what I was gonna do. And I got a call from my agent telling me that it was on the New York Times bestseller list. Then I texted my family just to tell them. And I also was like, well, this is still weird. You know, it was still like, I'm still in the back of a car and nothing has changed except it feels like everything changed. So I just said to the driver, I just feel like I need to tell you that I just made the New York Times bestseller list. And he was so sweet and so excited. As I always say, like basically, the first line of my obituary has been written. Like I actually had that thought when I became a bestseller. Unless I do something else, this is gonna be the thing. I'm Jennifer Cation Armstrong. I'm an author, journalist, and teacher, and I am a creator. So this is the office. This is where I work in general. When I worked at Entertainment Weekly, it was part of the tradition that you would decorate your cubicle with your interests, right? To kind of show off so other people understood. So I have the pretend magazine cover from Entertainment Weekly that they give you when you leave, they'll sort of put your head on someone else's body that has been a cover already. So that's actually Tina Fey's body. I used to interview Tina Fey quite a bit when I was at Entertainment Weekly, I was out on the set of 30 Rock a lot. I was once on location with them. It was super, super cold out, but it was totally worth it because I was in the trailer huddling with Tina Fey and John Hamm, who was guest starring at the time. So I was like, this is like a fever dream I would have. When I was a kid, I was obsessed with the library. I can remember my mother dropping me off after school. And I would just stay there all afternoon. And so that's when I started kind of like getting obsessed with specific things often in pop culture and then just researching them like crazy. I would just spend all of my hours looking up, I don't know, George Michael and learning everything I could about him. I never wanted to just listen to the music. I wanted to just know everything I could about a person or a show or a movie. I did not know or see any working writers as far as I can remember. I think the only ones I really knew were like from movies. There's a lot of, you know, women especially depicted on film and on screen as journalists and writers, which is great. I think it gave us something to sort of look at. I started to look up writers like Nora Ephron, Judy Bloom. I kind of thought, let's figure out how to actually be a writer. And I started looking up all of these books about how to be a freelance writer. And it was really something I was very fixated on. My dad helped me get my first professional journalism job. He was like, you should write to all the local newspapers and tell them that you'll work for them. So I was a professional journalist by you know the time I graduated from high school, which is kind of cool. Somehow I got it in my head that there were these other opportunities that should be available to me, like being an author, like being a journalist at a national magazine, even though I was in the Midwest. It's a very specific experience to go from the Midwest, from growing up there to living in a place like New York City. Coming to New York, it's like everyone is like that. Instead of you being the one person you know who's like, no, 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 I'm going to make it. In the Midwest, you're, you know, kind of the outlier. And I'm not saying people didn't tell me I couldn't do this necessarily, but it wasn't like they knew how to do it or that they were like, oh, you definitely will. Whereas when I got to New York, I was around a bunch of people who instead of saying like, oh, that's weird, would say, oh, that's cool, I'm working on a novel too. Like, what's yours about? Do you have an agent yet? They would just say it in this way that made it seem so obvious and common that of course it was gonna happen. It was just a matter of when. I came with no job because that's just how you have to do it. You have to show up and be like, I'm here, someone employ me. I 
was hanging out with a lot of literary people and I was writing some short stories, trying to figure out what I would write next. It sounds crazy, but like I just really wanted to write books, but I just didn't have the specific idea yet. So got really inspired and decided to write a novel that was incredibly based on my own life at the time. It did not get published and I'm really glad it didn't because it was too, it was too much. It was too much about my life at that time. I also started to learn, which people should know, that many, many published authors who are successful have stories of first books that didn't happen. It took a couple years before I actually got back on the horse I've wanted to be an author, this is it. You know, why would you turn this down when it's this close? So major publisher, decent contract, assignment ready to go. And I just was like, all right, I'm gonna figure out how to write a nonfiction book now. My life was very exhausting when I was working a full-time job and writing a book at the same time. It was a dream come true in many ways, but it was a lot to do, and it was specifically a lot of writing. I would write all day, then I would come home and I would write. And then I would have a weekend and I would write. And then I would go on vacation so I could write. It just was a lot. I just didn't think that I could do this again if I was gonna write another book. My job was fairly demanding, and obviously I wanted to do the best job that I could on my books. And that was really what I realized is I want to do this and I want them to be good. What if I picked something I was really passionate about and I sold it for enough money that I could quit my job? I chose Mary Tyler Moore Show for my next book. I had been interviewing a lot of women in comedy. Tina Fey, Julia Louis-Dreyfus, and many, many more, all would answer if you asked them who their biggest influence was, Mary Tyler Moore and the Mary Tyler Moore Show. I actually have a photo of myself, and I'm probably three, where I legitimately, knowingly thought that I was dressing like Rhoda from the Mary Tyler Moore Show. It's crazy to me that I watched this show as such a tiny girl and found something in it because I really think that I saw these two women doing something other than being a mom, which I had already known. I knew I could play house, but this was like this new idea. And then the final thing that brought it all together was when I did some research and realized that it was the first show to have many women writing for it. I thought, my God, these women must be amazing if they were comedy writers in the 70s, they're gonna have stories. And I was correct about that. I was at work and I was in my little office and I think I actually got an email that, you know, we had sold it for more than enough money to Simon & Schuster. And I really did actually cry. I tend to be kind of stoic. And so it's one of the few times I can really remember like being super emotional exactly at the right time. And it was also really surreal because the next thought was, I guess I'm quitting this job that I've been at for 10 years. It was actually kind of hard at first to go full-time freelance author. My schedule started to drift wildly where I would be up until two and three in the morning and then get up at 11 because I could. And I realized finally, like, I have to start making schedules and giving myself deadlines. My dad was really excited about my Seinfeld book in particular, though he's always excited about all of my books. He was just such a supporter in all the right ways. I could tell he read my books. I remember him saying to me, Seinfeld is your best one. And he was always at all of my book events. 
It was a way that we connected. He wasn't like a super emotional guy, but I think he kind of knew how to do this. He knew how to be the dad of the good student first, which, which is what I was once, and then how to be a supportive dad of the author. And he was really, really proud of me. And he was always like selling my books to his friends and getting them signed for his friends. He once called the local Barnes and Noble and was like, why aren't you carrying my, my daughter's book? It was special just because it was hard for him to show emotions in a lot of other ways. And one way he showed it to me was just to be proud of me as an author. I'm glad he got to see that I got to be a bestseller. It took me a long time to be able to just tell people without being weird about it that I was a New York Times bestseller because it just feels sort of immodest and braggy and whatever. And I feel like it's a force outside of me. It's like that happened and it's great that it's mine, but I know that I wrote books that are equally as good and that they didn't happen to. And I know that this book was really good. In May of 2017, my dad died and unexpectedly. There was no run up to this. Absolutely, totally shocking. Like my mom called me on a Thursday and said he was dead, which was not something I was anticipating. And I was still in the thick of running around promoting Seinfeldia. And so it was a really, really hard time. And I had to just keep going. I actually think of the time between 2016 and 20, 19 as like the one of the hardest times of my life. And it's so weird because I was a bestseller and people love to ask me, what's it like being a bestseller and all of this stuff. And I feel almost bad because I feel like I can't authentically be like, it was amazing. So it was actually a really, really hard time, even though it was one of the best professional times of my life. Sex and the City and Us was about to come out in June of 2018. And I was walking back to get home. And when I looked up, I saw that there's an SJP pop-up store. So I went in and she was there, which it turns out she does or would do at least at the time sometimes. She would actually go to her store and sell shoes. That was crazy to me that I just walked in there and she was there. And I had interviewed her already for the book months earlier, but I reminded her who I was. And I was like, well, I'm going on book tour and thought I would check out your shoes to see what you have. And next thing you know, like, I mean, she really was again, as if she were just working at, you know, Aldo or something, was just like, well, let me show you some things that I think would be good. And I had, I was looking at this like pretty sexy, like skinny heel shoe. And she was like, those are gorgeous, but you're gonna be standing a lot. I have some better ideas for that particular situation. And so she showed me a couple of different shoes. She actually like got down and like br they brought out the sizes and she helped me put them on my feet. And it was just a bizarre culmination of all of this that Sarah Jessica Parker was like putting shoes on my feet and then I had to buy them. I wish I could tell you differently, but I really was like on my sofa the next Wednesday after Sex and the City and Us came out, like with my laptop. And it was very disappointing that it wasn't an instant New York Times bestseller. It is very telling what expectations do to you, which is something I learned a lot in what I write about. There's movies that are considered notorious flops and then you go back and watch them and you're like, this is fine, what was the problem? And the problem was there was an expectation. It's all about what you think going in, and that's what happened here. It, it did fine. It's totally respectable. It's just that it didn't make this list. And even the list, it's important to know, is relative. It's a ranking. So if you come out a week that a Harry Potter book came out back in the day, you're gonna get knocked down a slot. That's just the way it is. You might, on the other hand, come out in a week when it's just kind of quiet. And so you make it onto the list because everything was a little bit milder. So you can't totally ignore this stuff because it obviously makes a difference, for instance, to be able to say, 
that you're a New York Times bestseller, but you can't always expect that to happen. I'll have a list for book ideas and I have the same kind of list for article ideas. Everything goes on the list because you can take it off later. If you have a thought in the middle of the night, I always tell people, write it down. You're not necessarily going to remember it. Even if you think it's like the most life-changing idea and you're like, I'll never forget this. Then later you'll be like, did I have an idea? Sometimes that means you have very stupid ideas on your list, but at least then it's there and you can later look at it. This is so funny because I haven't looked at it in a little while. This is what happens too, is that I've done a thing here. These are bold. Some have stars. At, at some point I went in and was like, I'm really prioritizing some things. I literally have history of pop culture witches, which is not terrible. Netflix is not a bad idea. TRL, which I really wanted to do and have been shot down so far. And you can see, I really do write down everything so that in case I can figure something out later. And when Women Invented Television was on this list and had been on it since 2013, and it wasn't a book until 2021. I've actually been a full-time freelance author for 10 years, which is really exciting. I actually put it on my calendar recently because I want to make sure I remember to celebrate because that's a really big deal. I don't know necessarily that I was sure that was going to happen. I have to do some other things to sustain that and also to make it so that it's not this super high pressure situation to sell another book. And that can be really, really stressful if you're trying to get them to buy into your ideas, but also just worried about eating. So I do some basic freelance journalism, of course but I've also added other things in, like teaching through various platforms. One thing that a friend of mine said to me that really I took to heart was people value writing. You just need to find those people. And so it might not be the most high profile glamorous thing. It might not be in the New Yorker. It might be writing copy for Netflix or ghostwriting for someone or that kind of thing. And then there's also a lot of people who want to learn to be a successful writer and author, and people are constantly asking me about that. So teaching people that I actually really love, and it's one of my favorite things. It's actually really nice to have a way to talk to people through email, and I've gotten better at it, I think. The thing that people respond to most is when I tell them about my big projects. <laughs> when I tell them mostly about my books, that's the thing that gets the most response that people seem actually the most excited about in my email. So I have to realize that they actually signed up to hear about me and I should just go ahead and tell them, which is nice. I think we all go on that journey to some extent of like getting comfortable with telling people about your stuff and not feeling like you're just this self-promotional person, but realizing there are people who actually want to hear about it really helps. I would say that anybody who wants to do what I do, what I have done, is that you should start with something you're really excited about and work really hard to get that idea out in the world. If that one doesn't work, try another one. Keep going, don't take it personally. You might revive that other one later. Once you kind of get that momentum, I think the key is to just figure out ways to keep making it work because you do also have to pay your bills and eat and it, we wish it were more romantic than that. But you have to kind of balance then the business side and the part where you get to express yourself and your deepest heart's desires. I think now that I had the experience of having the bestseller, not having a bestseller. I can now be calm about it for the most part. It's always nice to have those extras, but I just love doing it and bringing it out into the world and telling people about things that I'm passionate about. That's what's exciting. This is the very beginning of my book, Mary and Lou and Rhoda and Ted, which is about the Mary Tyler Moore show. Starting a story in a nonfiction book is always really hard because you're at the point where you're actually the most overwhelmed with information. And now you have to figure out a way into the story. 
So I'm always looking for a human story, a story that a reader could read and see themselves in a little bit. And it is about one of my favorite people that I met doing the research for that, Treva Silverman. She was a writer for the Mary Tyler Moore Show eventually, and this is her backstory that I felt was very indicative of many of the women who wrote for the Mary Tyler Moore Show. Treva Silverman had always wanted to be the beautiful, funny, smart heroine of a 1930s screwball comedy. When Treva watched Jean Arthur and Carol Lombard, she wanted to soak up every last bit of them, the way her movie house popcorn soaked up melted butter. Treva had one other escape route from suburban ennui. Every week, she took the train from her family's home in Cedarhurst for more than an hour to get to New York City. It was where she belonged, she was sure. She'd race down to the New York Public Library in Midtown Manhattan to read her way through the vast stacks of the humor section in alphabetical order. She had found her people, the humor writers for The New Yorker. They had met daily throughout the 20s for lunches at the Algonquin Hotel, forming a loose camaraderie called the Algonquin Roundtable. They were known for their sharp witticisms and one-liners, which were quoted all over the newspaper columns. More importantly, the Algonquin Round Table consisted of men and, yes, women. Truva read on and on as afternoon turned into dusk, the shadows cast by the library's stone lions growing longer until they dissolved. She wished she could travel back to the days of the Algonquin Round Table, or even better, somehow getting a seat at that table. <laughs>